bonus zone. Yes, today we look at Beauty and the Beast live on stage at Hollywood Studios. But before we get to that, I need to explain a little bit about how I feel about the movie Beauty and the Beast. It's the greatest film of the Disney animated canon and possibly the second greatest non-Pixar film Disney ever released right after Mary Poppins. Why is that? Well, there are so many reasons. Sure, the Disney Renaissance may have started with The Little Mermaid, but Beauty and the Beast was the film that cemented it. This is the movie that has everything. Great songs, great animation, great characters, a horse who was totally voiced by Otis from The Andy Griffith Show. The film was made by animators who would go on to become considered some of the all-time greats, like that kid from Family Circus. But despite all the talent poured into it, you can't just say it was destined to be a masterpiece the whole time, the stars aligned from the beginning and everything went right on this one, because... it didn't. In fact, given the troubled production, it's kind of miraculous that this movie is even watchable, let alone a masterpiece. It was a story that Disney had toyed around with since the 40s, but can never get right. Production started in one of the most uncertain times in the history of Disney animation. The entire first act of the film was storyboarded and then thrown out, the director left and was replaced by guys who did an Epcot pre-show. What went right on this film? Well, I'm not going to claim that the entire success of the movie rests on one person, but the one guy who probably had the strongest influence on the film is the late, great Howard Ashman. Ashman and Alan Menken were already pretty well known for the world's greatest dark comedy musical ever to be based on a 1960s Roger Corman movie featuring a young Jack Nicholson when Disney approached them for a partnership, and Ashman leapt at the chance to work with animation. I said, what about animation? What about working in that department? That was what I really wanted to do, much, much more than anything really in live action. Because I'm really a musical theater person, and I do see a very, very strong connection between these two media. The duo brought their Broadway sensibilities, creating some spectacular songs for the film. Every single one reveals a bit of character, moves the plot forward, and is show-stoppingly catchy. Okay, I guess Human Again didn't reveal all that much we didn't glean from elsewhere in the movie, but that was cut from the theatrical version anyway, and it's still not a bad song. Alan Menken doesn't know how to write a bad song. Except the pointless ones and Margaret sings in Newsies, but those are forgivable because shut up. With the duo's involvement, other pieces started to fall into place, such as the greatest collection of characters from any Disney fairy tale movie. The supporting cast is full of colorful individuals who provide a lot of humor and a lot of pathos. The villain manages to be both genuinely hilarious and legitimately threatening in a manner not often seen without the last name Tannen. The prince actually has a character arc. Hell, the prince actually has a personality unlike these guys. Granted, like these guys, he still doesn't have a name that's mentioned on camera, but hey, baby steps. And true fans know that his real name is Prince Adam. And the masters of the universe! It was a question of sort of who, who you want the spotlight to be on. The character who goes through the greatest change, both inwardly and outwardly, is the Beast. Therefore, it's the Beast's story. Yes, in a lot of ways this is the Beast's story, but despite my gushing a moment ago about his portrayal, he is only one of the title characters. And for my money, the character that really holds the film together is Belle. Belle is undisputedly the best of the Disney princesses. I mean, she's smart, she's kind, and she's awesome. But don't take my word for it, let's go straight to the source. So Belle, what is it that makes you the best princess? Oh my, we're all such nice princesses. And she's humble too. <laughs> so Aurora, what is it that makes Belle the best princess? It's probably her beast. He's a very charming beast and he keeps her very sweet and humble. <laughs> False. Sorry, Aurora, but you cannot possibly be more wrong. No wonder you only had like 30 lines in your own movie. One of the things that makes Belle the best princess is she doesn't need to be rescued by a prince. She's the one who saves the day. There are only three instances in the movie where men even try to rescue her. Maurice tries to rescue her from the beast. He fails and Belle has to pick up the pieces. Gaston tries to rescue her from the beast. Sort of. He fails and Belle has to pick up the pieces. The beast tries to rescue her from wolves. He succeeds, but Belle still has to pick up the pieces. Belle is the hero of this movie, and she kicks ass. She's smart, kind, and willing to be self-sacrificial for the one she loves, but not at the expense of being her own person. Plus, she's a literature nerd. And if I may be shallow for a moment, lit nerds are the second sexiest type of nerd. After film nerds, of course. Man, what can I be brown, Joey? Now, some people have criticized Beauty and the Beast for promoting Stockholm Syndrome or planting the idea in young girls' minds that they should date the abusive guy because they can change him. Yeah, if anyone thinks that's the message this movie's promoting, they're not paying attention to the movie. I mean, that may be the message of the original fairy tale, but since when does Disney actually follow the source material? I don't recall an animatronic prince tripping and dislodging a bit of animatronic apple from animatronic Snow White's animatronic throat. Not that I can go back and animatronic check anymore. The point is, yes, at the start of the movie, the Beast isn't exactly pleasant boyfriend material. He's whiny, short-tempered, and, well, spoiled, selfish, and unkind, because he's a sheltered, pampered prince, spending all of his time in Prince World. Prince has been living in Prince World for quite some time. 
and when he doesn't get his way, he flies off the handle. And yes, it's bad to tell little girls to stay with dangerous guys who act like this, so the movie doesn't. Cersei Mercer covered this a while ago in her Beauty and the Beast video, and seriously, if you don't watch her show, what the hell are you even doing on the internet? But basically, as soon as the Beast starts acting legitimately threatening, Belle gets out of there as fast as she can. She only comes back after the Beast does something to legitimately help her. And even then, she doesn't let him completely off the hook. Belle didn't try to change him into boyfriend material. He certainly changed because of her, but she didn't start to like him until after the change had already started. So yeah, I'm rather fond of this movie. And so was the rest of the world. And given the hype around the film, a park attraction was pretty much inevitable. But hey, why spend tons and tons of money right now building a ride when you can spend a little bit of money right now building stage show sets and tons and tons of money over time paying actors? Disney premiered the live show at MGM Studios the day the movie came out, and a live version also premiered at Disneyland the year after. The Disney World version has been modified since then, and the Disneyland version closed after three years, but it was still generally popular. And just to bring things full circle to Ashman's theatrical sensibilities, the live shows in the park served as a proof of concept for the massively successful Broadway version, a show that has been performed all over the world, including a performance by my very own high school. The year after I graduated. So my stupid brother and my stupid sister got to be in it, but I didn't, even though the school invited me back to be one of the camera operators, so I had to shell out my hard-earned cash for a 5 a.m. train ticket back to Connecticut to watch four performances of an awesome show I didn't get to be in, and then when I took the train back to school, I accidentally got off at the wrong stop because I sucked at Pennsylvania geography back then, and I had to take a $150 cab ride back to campus, not that I'm bitter. Well, that's enough setup. It's time to take a look at the show itself. So I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a stealth pun or not, but the show begins with a bell. Well, I'm not going to ask for whom it tolls. Wow, already it's just like the movie. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, a young prince lived in a shining castle. A young Tasmanian prince, apparently. <laughs> The prince was spoiled, selfish, and unkind. But he was adept at Tai Chi. One winter's night, an old beggar woman came to the castle and offered him a single rose in return for shelter. You don't often see interpretive dance to the sounds of Major Charles Emerson Winchester. Appearance, the prince sneered at the gift and turned the old woman away. But she warned him not to be deceived by appearances, for beauty is found within. Within her hood, where she was clearly attractive. As punishment, she transformed him into a hideous beast. Yeah, he's hideous! Oh, wait. Ah, thanks guys, my back was killing me. And earn their love in return. The spell would be broken. If not, he would be doomed to remain a beast. Whoa, Thing let himself go. As the years passed, he fell into despair. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. What did I miss? For who could ever learn to love a beast? Could it be the contestant behind curtain number one? <laughs> it's a town of living statues. The NWA must have their hands full. Well, it was quiet. Do you have to start every morning with a solo? Full of living statues. Bonjour! 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 Six shows a day all freaking week. Every morning feels the same since the morning that we came to this war proving to town. Good morning, Bill. And welcome to Brown Town. Let us finish the most wonderful story about a beanstalk. That's nice. Marie, the back dance. Bakers always conduct business in the middle of the street. The girl is so yes, yeah, so unlike you, perfectly normal circus clowns. Gotta have blue hair. Remember, Belle's the peculiar one. It's hard to stay frozen in this position. You haven't traded the book yet. You're still reading Jack and the Beanstalk. 
Now I understand the necessity of a small cast here, but the problem is in the movie the whole town is singing about Belle, and here it just seems like a small group of bullies and stalkers. Ah, but here comes France's favorite jerkwad. I should be more specific. Stand aside, make way! Say hello to me, that lousy wench. Right from the moment when I met her, saw her. I that lousy you. wench I forgive immediately because she's hot. Here in town there's only she, who is beautiful as me. So I'm making plans to move and marry Belle. Perfect! <laughs> and then Gaston does the most villainous thing imaginable. He interrupts the hero song with his own song. Gaston! <laughs> Not a bit of him scraggly or scrur not doing that part. No, 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 it, it, it's okay. I mean, I, I memorized that part. It was going to be my big solo, but no, we, we can skip that part. That's fine. No one hits like Gaston matches with like Gaston. No one cuts the last verse right in half like Gaston. I'm especially good at expectorating. Eh, yeah, I bet Guybrush could still beat you. When I was a lad, I ate four dozen eggs every morning to help me get large. And now that I'm grown, I eat five dozen eggs. died from breathing in his overdose of Axe Body Spray. And then, even when the hero song comes back, it starts off with the villain's verse. Gaston! It's redundant to keep on singing about Gaston when we just heard his song. This number's been going for far too long. Tiny town of gossips, douchey guy pursuing bookworm protagonist who has a single parent. This is actually a Gilmore Girls musical, isn't it? Yeah, does this look infected to you? It's you, for a reason. How about it, Belle? Marry me. Can I have my book back, Gaston? It's not right for a woman to read, Belle. You are positively a prime evil. Excuse me. Gaston, please stop. You will marry me, Belle. Someday you'll be my wife! Today's the day when all of your dreams come true. <laughs> you possibly know about my dreams? You haven't even heard my I Want song yet. Let's skip to it right now. To have someone understand the concept of pacing. Not that I'm one to talk. Ah, the town's getting sucked into a black hole! Belle got more adventure than even she in her wildest imagination could have dreamt. But through a series of strange circumstances, she found herself held captive. Really? No elaboration, no details, just a series of strange circumstances? You might want to rethink your career writing for Spark Notes. Elizabeth Bennet had several sisters, an overbearing mother, and an apathetic father. Then some other shit happened, and Mr. Wickham turned out to be a douche nozzle. Master will be furious if he finds out what we are up to. Whatever it is that we are up to. There is nothing to worry about. No, nothing. Just our entire future. We might be in sequels. Awful, awful sequels. Our guests for dinner. We'll keep it simple. What are you talking about? What Chip speaks for the audience. Come on, Mom. Come along, Chip, dear. Oh, dear. No need to worry. We'll keep it simple. Hi. 
Why? Was each line written on a separate card right before a game of 52 picked up? I said spin! I mean quiet! If we're going to do this, then let's do it. I now approve for a reason. Wait, he's talking to us. We're supposed to be the guests? That's the lamest audience participation element yet. And now, we invite you to relax, pull up a chair, as the dining room proudly presents your dinner. Okay, Be Our Guest is an amazing song, and it's almost impossible to screw it up. But Lord knows they'll try their hardest. And spin. And spin. And spin. And spin. Hey, you're not spinning. There. By the way, what are we strange people supposed to be? This is great. I'm starving. So, so what is there to eat? What are they? They can't be human servants. That doesn't make any sense in the story. Okay, yeah, one of those. One of those too. Oh, uh, how long before it's ready? Hello? Yeah, these are okay, but I really need protein. Do you have even, like, a balance bar? And of course, it's not an American representation of France until the first can-can. I mean, I guess with those baker's hats, they could be salt and pepper shakers or something. Those are really frilly dresses. What are they, napkins? Okay, so you're taking me to the food now, right? Food, eat. They're all really colorful. Wait, are they like cupcakes, pastries, desserts? Are they asking Belle to eat them? Is the Beast Castle actually Millaways? I severely underestimated the new Fantasyland expansion. Do the kicks, do the kicks, jump and spin around a spin around a spin around a bit. That's it. Fellas, mime as though you're hiking up your pants. Hi, hi. And ladies, now it's time to moon the girl behind you in this dance. Yes, this damn endless dance. Oh good, giant spoons. Now they're ready for a giant midnight screening of The Room. Yeah, unless that spoon is just slathered in turkey chili or something, I don't care. Me old bamboo, me old bamboo, you better never bother with me old bamboo. Yeah, if there's one thing the scene was missing in the movie, it's annoying girls with squeaky voices. And a peacock. Sadly, there are more people in this live audience than there are watching NBC these days. Hello, giant cup delivery for Icy Wiener. God, what the hell is that? I've never seen a cake come out of the dancer before. Unless she's not really a cake, Belle's just so hungry she's seeing her as one. Look, I am just seconds away from eating my own hair ribbon. Hmm, what do we do with the characters with no legs? I know, put them at the front of a kick line. Fine, a finger full of gravy. There, I'll take it. Hooray, I'll never be hungry again. Despite my snark, as you can clearly see, this is a good dance number. I mean, sure, it goes on for too long, and the group sing-along doesn't live up to the coolness of a Jerry Orbach solo, and it would mean more coming from the characters than from random servants dressed as... whatever. But it's still Be Our Guest, and it's the most energetic song in the Disney animated canon, and it's impossible to have a bad mood after hearing it. But enough dragged-out dance numbers, it's time to return to Rush Dialogue! I am the master of this castle! You're just now introducing yourself. <laughs> Never seen me as anything but a monster. He hasn't seen you at all yet. And hop. At least you're working to downplay that monster perception. Try to understand, Master. The poor girl has lost her father and her freedom all in one day. What father? Can I remind you that your 21st birthday will be here soon? I know that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 21st birthday be here soon. 10 years they've been rusting. That prince at the beginning was 11? Well, no wonder he was unkind. He was an 11-year-old brat. 
who had the disease Robin Williams had in Jack. Worst Dawson casting ever. Perhaps she has come to break the spell. Remember, you must learn to love another and earn their loving return. I know. Hey, you guys suck at subtle exposition. Yes, yes, human again. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's very good. Yes, the super secret West Wing located in the middle of the lobby. Oh, oh no. I thought I told you never to come here. No, you didn't. It's none of your business. Please stop. Or I'll tell mom. Come to the West Wing. And you should learn to control your temper. I can't help it. Well, how do you know if you don't even try? Oh, Rob! <laughs> Say something nice to her. Try to act like a gentleman. I, I apologize. Apology accepted. Really? Really? No saving her from wolves, no actual indication that he has a good side, just a hastily mumbled apology that sounds less convincing than if Edward Cullen says he respects you as your own person? And she goes for it? What happened to you, Belle? That's it. Gently, gently. I, 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 I've never felt this way before. I've never felt this rushed before. What sweet? He barely mumbled sorry. He was mean and he was coarse. You've gone through the entire emotional arc in 15 seconds with no visible motivation. Because you just met him! Haha, <laughs> <laughs> vague, pointless physical comedy. She glanced this way, I thought I saw. And when we touched, she didn't shudder at my paw. At least I don't think she shuddered, I can't see anything through this mask. And spin. And spin. Looked at me that way before. She's never looked at you at all before two minutes ago. What, the expression on Lumiere's face? Yeah, that's more than just a bit alarming. Dude, I'm right here. In just five minutes. A few days more. There may be something there that wasn't there before. Like character motivation. You know, perhaps there is something there that wasn't there before. Like shared stage time. There may be something there that wasn't there before. Like any semblance of plot development. Shh. I'll tell you when you're old. One of the great fairy tale romances, and he pulls the fake yawn. Bell has turned it down for the last time. It was also the first time we only met once. Rejected. It's more than I can bear. This exposition would feel a lot more natural if I had a short comic relief sidekick to rant at. Oh, I am disgraced! Someone has to protect our village! Kill the beast! Ah, wait, what beast? Yeah, this is the first we've heard about any beast. Come on, man! Let's go get him! He just said out loud that this was just a plan and they're still falling for it. Most easily duped mob ever. Excuse me, sir, I'm trying to trick you. May I see your wallet for a minute and not run away with it? Well, you were upfront about trying to trick me, so I guess you're an honest fellow. Ha! Tricked you! There's nothing in here but a blockbuster card. I say we kill the beast! We kill him! You don't see him until he's dead. You come stalking on us every night. To sacrifice your children to his god. His appetite. You wreak havoc on our lives if we lay him on the free. So it's time to take some action, boys. It's time to rob a man. Did I tell you to spin, followers? Come on, the dark 
darkness and the shadows. It's a nightmare, but it's one exciting ride. Which is more than could have been said about Superstar Limo. Robert of a castle, and there's something truly really terrible inside. That could have been said about Superstar Limo. Which, with this show's pacing, will be about 15 seconds. If you're not with us, you're against us! Nobody said they're not with you. First, first, fail. Now, which one of you has the park map? But I'm not sure if I'm really in this scene. Seems they can be wrong about how many 50 is. Stage climax! I didn't know they were allowed to do that! I. I'm sorry, I need a moment. So what? The extras are even fighting by spinning? How does that work? Unless they got those cloaks from. Well, it makes as much sense as anything else in the show. Ah, finally, the famous romantic dance scene. Even the characters with no hands fight better than the 50 Frenchmen. I somehow knew you thought that. Get out of here. That's what they did to me when I tried to film Carousel of Progress. As soon as Gaston said, someone like me, at least one of you out there was hoping I'd make an Adele reference, or a Kings of Leon reference, or a reference to any of the other 427 songs that include the phrase, someone like you in the lyrics. This is the best I can do, but I hope you feel acknowledged. Murder time! Bow, dow, dow, dow. And Gaston just wanders off without retribution. For great justice! Jeez, he's milking his death scene more than they milked the High School Musical franchise. No. Oh, beast. No. You came back. When did she ever leave? I couldn't let them do this to you. I tried to warn you. This is all my fault. When did you try to warn him? How is this your fault? I can't has clarity? I get to see you. Last time. Before you go back in the Disney vault. I won't let it's you die. Better this way. No, no, please. Please don't leave me. I love you. Anyway, good luck with the whole death thing. So, in an interesting interpretation, the witch herself comes back to break the spell or to do the misdirection dance while the actors switch out behind a sheet. You don't see a lot of witches with tie-dye legs. What's with all the lightning? Do they need to power the beast's flux capacitor? Where the hell did this shirt come from? Bell. It's me. Prince.
Prince Alexander of Daventry. And now I'm having second thoughts. You look like you're 11. So whatever happened to the servants? Oh, I'm sure they're fine. Well, Gaston's still on the loose. Hey, Karma will catch up to him. Didn't someone mention me having a father? He went to live on a farm where we could play with all the other fathers. Snow White's dad. Cinderella's dad. Phineas and Candace's biological dad. Is he at least reunited with Mom? Nah, she ran off to Acapulco with Ariel's mom. So we finally get the sounds of Jessica Fletcher singing an Oscar song. The couple begins to dance. Some cosplayers of Charlotte from Princess and the Frog show up. The couple actually kisses on stage, unlike other couples in this park I could name. And... Some bellhops get lost on their way to the Tower of Terror. Do I want to know where they're going or why the bellhops are coming with them? Your rooms are not ready yet, but you can wait in the library. Oh crap, we're supposed to be next door, I'm sorry. Yeah, spin, whatever, spin. You know, I used to think this was the most dizzifying Disney attraction. Huh, spinning within spinning. Spinception! Even though that's not the thing in the movie the title refers to, but whatever, this is the internet. How much you want to bet one of the developers of the show framed his memo from Eisner suggesting they change the title to Spin City? Okay, if they're gonna drag out the ending this long, can they at least include the scouring of the Shire? But then the royal couple emerges, dressed in their iconic romantic dance outfits. And they proceed to serve the rest of these so-called dancers by... ...doing the exact same dance we've been watching for what I'm pretty sure has been the past two hours. You know, if this was the Haunted Mansion, I'd be leading. Okay, as a general rule, I try not to comment on the actors in the show for a few reasons. For one thing, they change from show to show, and I prefer to talk about the consistent experience that you'll get when you come to Disney World, Taylor Swift notwithstanding. But more importantly, they may be actors, but they're also theme park employees. Every single one of them is giving it their all over and over in shows largely designed to funnel people into gift shops. And having worked in an amusement park myself, even if it was a less glamorous job at a less glamorous park, I don't want to make cheap cracks about people who are just doing their jobs and doing them well. However, it does make me really, really happy how much the prince here looks like Barmy Fungi Phipps. I don't think I've ever been to Kensington. Yes, you have. Your mother lives there. Oh, that Kensington. That actor has no line, so only Belle gets mic'd. Beauty and the Beast. Hey, great to see you. You're all fired. Yeah, scram. Ha! <laughs> they kissed twice. Take that, Ariel and Eric. Enjoy your passionless marriage. So, how was the show? It's good, but flawed. Yes, it has good dancers. Yes, I'll take any excuse to listen to these songs. And yes, it has the seal of approval from George Utley and Johnny Fever. If you just take a shallow look at it, there's nothing really wrong with it other than some pacing issues. It's only when you start to really analyze that the flaws become noticeable. Condensing the story was necessary, but in doing so, they lost key parts of the character arcs, crucial elements that separated these characters from the rest of the Disney fairy tales. Sure, it has the face of Beauty and the Beast, and maybe even some of the heart, but it doesn't quite have the... soul, I guess? It certainly doesn't have the spleen of Beauty and the Beast, I can tell you that much. And sadly, that's a symptom of a lot of Disney attractions. The Disney Corporation becomes so concerned with branding on a superficial level that they slap their character licenses on everything without stopping to think about the things that gave those characters depth in the first place. And I know what you're thinking. Depth? In a theme park attraction? That's a stupid thing to ask for. People go to theme parks to be mildly distracted, not to be personally affected in some way. It's an amusement park, not a confusement park. And that's a fair point, audience member who sounds like me doing a stupid voice. 
But I believe that entertainment, any form of entertainment, can be more than just distraction. I mean, there was a time where the deepest cinema ever got was tricking the audience into thinking they would be run over. But hey, Hollywood grew out of that phase. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> this moment brought to you by Topical Humor. Dating your jokes before they're even released. Since 1907. <laughs> and I'm not saying I want theme park attractions to make guests cry or dive into existential dilemmas. I just think if you're telling a story, you should keep the elements that make that story special. But I guess that's what we have the movie for, and if all you want to do is sit down for a half hour and hear some great Mencken and Ashman songs, this is a good show and you should see it in person. I mean, I know you just watched it, but seeing something on video is never the same as seeing it live. And next time you're at Hollywood Studios, you should definitely check the show out. It may not capture the depth of the movie, but it does capture quite a bit of the fun. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to pay tribute to the depth of the movie the best way I know how. Crossover fanfiction with the X-Men. Torn Between Two Beasts, Chapter 19.